tonight, frustration and fury sweeps across America. In dozens of states, outrage over the death of George Floyd boils over onto the nation's streets. This is News 4 with breaking news. St. Louis's prosecutor has filed suit claiming there's a coordinated and racist conspiracy to stop her from doing her job. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Savard. This is the CBS Weekend News. Good evening. I'm Steve Savard reporting from KMOV in St. Louis. Anger and anguish with America on edge tonight. Protests erupting in dozens of cities following Monday's arrest and death of George Floyd in police custody in Minneapolis. Most of the protests have been peaceful, then at night turning to rage. This was Ferguson, Missouri, where the wounds are still raw from the shooting death in 2014 of Michael Brown by a police officer. This morning, America's newspapers told of the pain, tension, and heartache, including Minneapolis and St. Paul, which saw its fifth night of violence. We begin there with CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Pegues. Yeah, Maurice, uh, anybody who doesn't give, I, I understand it's difficult to win a game seven on the road against an experienced team like Boston, but anybody not giving the Blues a chance to win tonight has not been paying attention to anything they've done in the last five months. Across this country, two crises have converged. Protests over the death of George Floyd and the pandemic. The virus is still spreading in several states. The U.S. death toll now topping 104,000, the most in any country by far. After Pearl Harbor was attacked and the United States drawn into World War II, St. Louis native Jim Sella wanted to serve his country. But he was too young, so he waited until high school graduation. And at age 17, with his mother's permission, he enlisted in the Navy. His country needed him, Jim thought, and his desire to avenge what happened at Pearl Harbor is still palpable almost 80 years later. This weekend is your last chance to ride the Del Mar Loop trolley. The struggling service will close up shop on Sunday. Officials have worked for months to secure money to keep the trolley rolling. But right now, the only option under serious consideration is Bi-State, which operates Metrolink and Metro buses. Bi-State says it's reviewing ways to help the trolley but admits no one knows when that could happen. He spent 24 years behind bars. Now it appears Lamar Johnson's quest for a new trial has hit another snag. Today, a judge ruled that Johnson's motion for a trial should be dismissed, due in part to conflict of interest concerns in the St. Louis Circuit Attorney's Office. The judge also says the court does not have the authority to grant a new trial. The Circuit Attorney's Office says they plan to appeal. In 1995, Lamar Johnson was convicted in Marcus Boyd's murder in South City. His attorneys say prosecutors never disclosed that the only witness was paid. A chilling smile and a mugshot of a man accused of threatening a mass shooting in Missouri. Brian Groner of Jefferson City is in jail tonight charged with making a terroristic threat. Police say he was arrested after identifying himself on Facebook as, quote, your next mass shooter. Documents say he told investigators, quote, the Columbine shooters were lame because they only killed 12 people and said he could do better. They can only hope the rest of their mission goes as well as the trip to their new home in space. Steve? A rousing success, Mark. Thank you. And we in St. Louis particularly proud of astronaut Bob Bankin. He's a St. Louis native. We're proud of what he's accomplished. Straight ahead on the CBS Evening News, more of America on edge as protests in a deadly pandemic converge. There is really no polite way to say it. A Missouri man is in jail because he passed gas, although that is not his official charge. According to the Clay County Sheriff's Twitter page, yes, this was on Twitter, they were searching for a suspect wanted for a felony warrant. Deputies say he passed gas so loudly it gave up his hiding spot. The man was taken into custody immediately. I don't know what you all were thinking as I was reading that. I was thinking, at what point did my career veer so violently <laughs> off the tracks? <laughs> that it's come to this. The Stanley Cup, as Mo mentioned, was in the house. All the pieces were in place for, like you said, maybe the biggest celebration we've seen. We're used to the Cardinals winning. Yeah. We saw a pretty big one with the Rams 20 years ago, but this is a novelty in 52 years. The Blues were a win away. It's too bad the Cup has to get packed up and now shipped to Boston for Game 7. Fans are starting to file out. It's still about half full here. They enjoyed watching on the Jumbotron every single member of the Blues organization hoist the Stanley Cup. And I tell you who got the loudest cheers, Craig Berube, a guy with very few words, but nobody in these parts, no Blues fan will ever forget what he did and what he was able to accomplish. It's really an amazing story. First thing he said he had, he told the alums he had to do, he had to bring the team together. He had to get the guys to start playing for one another. He did that. They turned the corner after Jordan Bennington went in goal. 
and the Blues are now Stanley Cup champions. Last month, you'll remember, heavy rains caused flooding problems throughout the area, including in East St. Louis. Remember that video of the young students getting off the school bus, wading home through waist-high water? Well, Lauren Traeger's following up on the situation in East St. Louis. She's live, and Lauren, I understand, much better this time around so far. Steve Savard is in Joplin tonight with more for us. Steve. Vicki, I'm in front of the uh, destroyed St. John's Regional Medical Center, which really has become the symbol of the destruction done by the tornado one year ago today. Across the street is Cunningham Park, also heavily destroyed. Residents have gathered for a moment of silence, which will take place at 541 tonight, the exact moment the tornado touched down a year ago today. Across the street, up beyond where the fire truck is, that's where lifelong resident John DeGraff's house stood until a year ago today. He survived the tornado by going to a neighbor's basement. Both houses were blown away. Ralph Goldsticker was 20 years old, living in University City and working as a clerk when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December 1941. He enlisted in the Army Aviation Cadet Corps, intending to become a pilot, despite the fact that he'd never been on a plane. Ralph says he'd seen them in movies, and they sure looked glamorous. Well, he eventually became a bombardier aboard the B-17, nicknamed the Flying Fortress. Two of the 35 missions he flew in 1944 came on historic D-Day, June 6th. Ralph and his crew spent more than 14 hours in the air that day, dropping bombs on Sword Beach in Normandy, France, helping the Allies win arguably the most significant military battle in modern history. I was stationed right here in the front in the plexiglass nose, and the navigator's right next to me. Then we had a pilot and a co-pilot here, and then the engineer had two guns in the top turret, and the ball turret operator had two in the lower turret. I had two 50 caliber guns in the nose, and uh, my duties were to arm the bombs. The bombs are not armed when we take off. We have to take the cotter pin out of the, the fuse to arm the bomb. So I do that before the 10,000 feet and go on oxygen. On D-Day, Ralph's crew took off from an air base in England at 2 a.m. Because of the vast number of Allied planes employed in the operation, they had to fly north to Scotland just to get in formation. Almost five hours after taking off, they finally approached the coast of France. Sensing the significance of the moment, Ralph tagged the pin he pulled from the first bomb he dropped on the beaches. In fact, uh, this is the pin from one of the, the first bomb I dropped on, on D-Day. That's the one at 6.58 a.m.? Yep. Pin drop from bomb leaving our ship 297222 on D-Day, June 6, 1944, RPG time. 0658. Ralph's B-17 would take off again on mission number two in the afternoon. On his way to bomb German railroad lines behind the beaches, he had a clear view of the enormity of the largest amphibious military landing in history. That afternoon, I could see uh, the whole harbor. I mean, these thousands, I had read 7,000 ships were in the harbor, all kinds of vessels, from battleships down to landing craft and everything. Everything but canoes, I think, were in there. <laughs> but uh, we had it easy that day, but the people on the ground, a different story. I mean, they had a tough, tough time. <laughs> you did what you did. Among the many awards and citations Ralph earned for his valor in World War II are the Legion of Honor for helping liberate France from Nazi occupation, and the one he cherishes more than the rest, the Distinguished Flying Cross. All in a day's work, Ralph would have you believe. And we aren't heroes. We all did our job. That's it. I particularly don't think myself as a hero. Never did and never will. I mean, we all did a job. That was it. I can't imagine uh, maybe an Audie Murphy or something like that's a real hero or Butch O'Hare, but the rest of us are doing our job and we survived. So we aren't heroes, we're survivors. Ralph says his D-Day missions weren't his most harrowing or even his most interesting, but their importance certainly cannot be overstated. After our interview, Ralph asked me not to make him out to be a hero. I told him I'd let you viewers decide that for yourselves. I know where I stand. 
Ralph will turn 98 later this month, so happy birthday, Ralph, and thank you for your service.